It is my privilege to uh, give a quick introduction for the individual that's going to be with us today. He's a good friend of mine, good friend of Dallas Seminary. His name is Mark Lowry. Uh, he is a humorist, a songwriter. He is an author. He has been involved in Christian ministry for a long time. He sang for years uh, with the Grammy award-winning Gaither Vocal Band, and he's been around Dallas Seminary before, so it is okay to laugh. You with me? It's okay to laugh a lot today. But without any further introduction, he's been doing this since the age of 11. I have no idea what he was doing before then. But would you please join me in welcoming Mark Lowry today? Well, I am so honored to be here, y'all. I went to a Christian school too. I went to Liberty Baptist College in 1975. And I crammed four years of college into five. And I was paroled in 1980. And while I was in college, uh, the Lord called me to do this. I was, gonna, I was studying a business, right? I went to be a businessman like my dad. And the Lord spoke to me. And I'm Baptist. He never does that audibly. <laughs> he knows I faint. But it was in my heart. It was louder than audible. And uh, the Lord called me. And he really did. I can give you more details on that later but, or someday. But I, he started fulfilling things I like when he called me in my spirit it was on the Sunday afternoon I was laying in bed we didn't have air conditioning at the Liberty Baptist College our our beds came from an insane asylum <laughs> they had dents in them and um <laughs> but the Lord spoke to me and said why won't you do what I want you to do and I start I was praying at the time and I never had heard him speak like that and out of the blue, and I said, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do, and you know it, even if it means going to music. Uh, really? I said, okay. So I said, this, you know, this is your idea. You get the word out. And he did. Within a week, I was traveling, singing. From 1980 to 1988, I was doing 200 concerts a year for young people. I was young myself then. And I would do youth rallies and all kinds of stuff, high school assemblies, you know. We'd do five a day, and then on Friday, we'd have a pizza blast, and we'd invite all those kids out. And I did that for 80 to 88, and then Bill Gaither came along, picked me up out of those young people, and dropped me into a sea of geriatrics. <laughs> and I love them, too. My two favorite groups. God has been so good to me because I love young people and I love old people. They're my two favorite groups. Young people are a clean slate and old people are clean in their slate. <laughs> They're getting ready to go home. I told my dad the other day, you're still here because your mansion's not ready or something. He's 89. Some people just don't know when to go home. But, and I think that's true for about all of us. You know, 100 years ago, if you were 40, you're dead. That's right. They died at 42. That was the average life expectancy of a man, 42. Now we got medicine. People don't know when to die. <laughs> Y'all need to lay down. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but anyway, so the Lord told Gaither, I guess, that I'd fit in. And, and I started traveling with them and speaking to people and, and uh, loving that journey. I, I wanna encourage you to look for God while you're here. You're studying the word, but my gosh, if you leave here without Jesus, you have wasted your time. Make sure you really know him. Have a head-on collision with him. Pray that the Lord will give you a Damascus Road experience. I haven't had one, but I've chosen to believe. I've never had a head-on collision. I've never been blinded for three days like Paul was. But I chose to believe, and in the choosing, everything changed. For those of you who might still wondering about that, that whole thing, let's do make it real. That was a good idea, Q. If I never feel a thing, I claim him even so, because I believe. Lord, help my unbelief. I love that song. I love all these songs. I love any song that talks about Jesus I'm now 63 years old. I've been doing this a long time. And I still, the older I get, the more nervous I get that the Lord won't go with me. And he has never not gone with me. I've never touched the stage when he wasn't there with me. 
He's been faithful for all these years and I hope it encourages you to see an old guy tell you how faithful he is. And I want to tell you something else. It's the, it's the love of God I have learned that will constrain you, not the fear of God. And I know the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. That was my mother's favorite verse. But like Vestal Goodman, my Pentecostal friend, Vestal Goodman, y'all probably don't even know who she is, but back in the 60s, she was the she was an amazing singer, always talking in tongues, always trying to get me to do that. And I told her I was still learning English. <laughs> and, but, oh, I loved her. And, and, and she prayed for people, and they got healed. And I prayed for people. And, and I'm serious. I have prayed for people. And they die. <laughs> Anybody want to go home tonight? Form a line. <laughs> You'll be home by morning. Who'll be first? Uh, so, you know, I was reading in the Bible one day about doubts, about old Thomas, poor Thomas, you know, he got a bad rap because he skipped church on Sunday. You know, Jesus was crucified and then he showed up on Sunday. Well, who would know? He slept in, I guess, because he said, unless I stick my fingers in the holes in his hands, I won't believe. This is why I love Jesus. He had, Jesus had just told Mary, don't touch me. I haven't ascended to my father. But he told Thomas, I'll break the rules to get you home. That may be a hyperbolic statement to say in a seminary, but, <laughs> but, I, but didn't he do that with another time? He broke sh wheat off of the stalk and fed it on the Sabbath. And he broke that rule that they didn't like. You know, they didn't like that. And they called him out, and he pointed to a whoremonger as his excuse. Here is Jehovah on foot, and he said, David did it. That reminded me of my brothers. Mike did it. But didn't he? He said, David did it. Jehovah pointing to David as his example. Wow. I, and also, I, I learned from Gloria. See, I didn't go to seminary, and I hate that. I wish I could have gone, or would, I would have gone. I'd never made it, but I'd still be there. But, <laughs> but I learned from Gloria Gaither one time that God is in the interruptions of our lives. She said that at, at the breakfast table one morning. And that is a smart woman. If y'all don't know who Gloria Gaither is, she, her blonde does not go to the root. She is brilliant. And... <laughs> I need to retire that joke. <laughs> anyway, um, we were having breakfast one morning, and she said, you know, it looks to me like God's in the interruptions of my life, and he sailed him in my plans. And I thought, whoa. Well, me too then. And I started thinking about my life. And it's been one interruption after another. I was born. That was the first one. <laughs> I didn't ask to be born, but mama met daddy, and bada bing, bada bang, here I am. And then I had the ADHD before they knew how to abbreviate it. When I was a kid, it wasn't ADHD, it was BRAT. I was the church brat. We all had our jobs. Daddy was a deacon, mama was a piano player, and I was the church brat. And uh, that was an interruption, not for me so much, because I'd not been here before, but for my parents to have a perfect child, and then I show up. They didn't try that again for nine years. <laughs> well, so then I grew up and I was interrupted by God that day when I was planning to be a businessman and God said, well, let's go this direction. So I said, okay, that was an interruption. And then I, I had a tumor. I grew a tumor right here on my thyroid. When I was 25, it's, I played with it for a year. I thought I had two Adam's apples. I didn't know what was going on. And I finally went to the doctor. He said, no, you got a thyroid tumor and we got to take it out. I said, okay, I'd never had a tumor before. I thought, this is going to be interesting. And so he said, but i got to let you know your laryngeal nerve runs down through there. And if I sever that nerve, it is one of the risks of this operation. If I sever that nerve, you will never make another noise. I said, let me tell you something. You sever that nerve, and when I wake up, you'll never make another noise. <laughs> you leave that nerve alone. I came up out of that surgery going, me, 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 you know, checking. <laughs> and then about two years later, I grew another tumor. That's why my face is lopsided. This is how it's supposed to look. This is what way it looked. Because 
this doesn't have a tumor. This is normal. This over here grew one. And the doctor said, it's a parotid tumor. And I said, well, what's that? And he explained it. And he said, we got to take it out. And, and neither of them were malignant, thank the Lord. But he said, we got to take it out. And I said, well, why? He said, because it'll just keep growing and you'll have another head hanging on your shoulders. <laughs> I said, okay. So he said, but I got to let you know your facial nerve runs down through there. There's always a nerve in the way. He said, your facial nerve runs down through there. And if I sever that nerve, you'll be paralyzed on that side of your face. I said, okay. So since I'd already been through one surgery, I thought I'd have a little fun with this one. And I knew how to do it because the last thing you think of when they put you under will be the first thing you think of when you come up. So I planned this. When I had the surgery, I come up out of the surgery and all the doctors and nurses are standing around looking at me and said, smile for me. And I went. <laughs> Did he send me on nerve? <laughs> he fainted. <laughs> no, he did. I made that up. Anyway, um, that was an interruption. And I thought, you know, if I've had, and this is where I want your input, seriously. You can contact me at contact at marklowry.com if you have the, any more of these interruptions I'm looking for. I'm trying to find all the interruptions I can in the Bible, just because I'm curious. I know Jesus was interrupted twice that I know of that were very important. The woman with the issue of blood, remember? She wasn't even supposed to be there. She snuck into town. And at this time, Jesus was a rock star. Everybody was around him, touching him, pushing him, hoping to get healed. And she sneaks into town, woman with the issue of blood. And he heals her and he says something to her he never said to anybody else in the Bible. Daughter. He elevated her. He was always elevating women. Women were the first one to see the empty tomb. They went and told the boys, and the boys said, we'll take it from here. <laughs> it was the women. Jesus was always elevating women. He did that all the time. And he said, daughter, you're, you're healed, you know. And then another time he was preaching, and we don't know what he was preaching about because nobody wrote it down. But the interruption made the Bible. He was on his third point. When they sawed through the roof and let a crippled guy down in front of Jesus, he saves him and then he heals him. And the interruption made the Bible and the sermon didn't. Here's God on foot preaching and nobody took notes. Can you imagine next Sunday your pastor's on his third point? You hear a chainsaw fire up on the roof. <laughs> They let a crippled guy down in front of your preacher and he's a Baptist, he can do nothing about it, so they have to haul him back up. You wouldn't remember the sermon either, would you? And then Mary was interrupted. Boy, wasn't she interrupted. Now, when I was in college, one of my professors said that Mary was 13. And I never did read that in the Bible, but we know she was young. And because they had to get started early. They're dead by 40. Seriously. I mean, they hit minute puberty hits. You better have a baby or you're never going to know them because you're going to die in 10 years. I mean, they didn't live long. So Mary is overcome by the Holy Spirit. The angel explains most of what was going to happen to her. And that had to have been an interruption. I was reading that this morning, in fact, and where the angel says, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And, and then Mary says, because Mary asked a question. She said, but I've never known a man, which was a good start of the conversation. That would be the first thing I'd ask too. How's this going to happen? But I wouldn't have stopped there. You got an angel in the room, ask him some questions. <laughs> it ain't time to break out into a concert. Get some questions. You know, the Magnificat. Get some questions. I'd have asked, could you run by my mother's room? She is going to need an explanation. <laughs> but the angel did stop by and tell Joseph. And there's an interesting character, Joseph. Never said one thing worth writing down. <laughs> Not one thing. I mean, even the cattle got in that they were lowing. How hard is it to make the Bible? Not Joseph, not a word. Then Mary, she was interrupted all through his life. One time, I think she even thought he'd gone a little crazy. And they went to get him. She and the other brothers, I guess, and 
He said, who is my mother? Who is my father? Sound a little rude, but if my mom thought I was crazy, I might say the same thing. <laughs> Interruptions. We've all had them. My mother said something to me that I'll never forget. That had such a big... Most of what we, I, I wrote about in Mary Did You Know came from conversations with my mother. My mother and I talked about Jesus my whole life, but we wanted to examine the human side of him. You know, the, did he skin his knee? You know, did Mary ever make him get a haircut? Did, did, you know, what was it like raising God? What was it like changing God's diapers? What was it like looking down and Jehovah was nursing at your breast? What was that like? So we... Talked about it my whole life, and, and then I wrote this song. I'm going to sing it uh, and let y'all out early, because unless y'all got any questions. <laughs> but this is the song I wrote in 1984, long before I knew what mansplaining was. <laughs> and uh, Buddy Green put music to it in 91. And uh, when I was 11, this was a literal answer to a prayer I prayed when I was 11. I went to the altar because this preacher came to our church and he said we're, that he preached on Solomon and said that we could ask for wisdom from God if you wanted it. And I thought, well, I sure could use some of that. So I went to the altar and asked God if I could have some wisdom. And then before I got up, I said, two more things I'd like. An interesting life, and I'd like to do something that will outlive me. That was 11, and I can still remember that. 40 years later, I'm at Walmart. Pick up Natalie Cole's CD and Mary Did You Know was on it and Donny Osmond's CD and Mary Did You Know was on it and I didn't even know they'd recorded it. And the Lord reminded me of that prayer and I said, oh boy, you outdid yourself, didn't you? <laughs> he will do that in your life. He'll drop surprises in your lap on your journey. They're, they're, I call them little diamonds along the road or little pieces of cake. Little foretastes of glory divine to let you know what's waiting at the house. On your journey, as you leave here from seminary, please look for those diamonds. They usually come on dark days. You know, I, don't, I, I, don't, I never remember a good day. But I can remember hitting Shepherd Drive without a helmet on my motorcycle. 2005, when I broke my leg, my friend Shelly called me and asked me if I'd meet her at the burrito shop. And I said, sure, I'd love a burrito. And it was a beautiful day in Houston. You know, we don't have a lot of those because it's so humid. Even the Pentecostals won't lift their arms any higher than that. <laughs> and I was driving down. I'm going to tell you this quick story before I leave. Uh, I was driving down Shepherd Drive on my scooter. And I, I do you all, anybody here ride motorcycles or scooters? Or any, no, you're too smart. You, you know, in Texas, you don't have to wear your helmet because we don't care about our stupid people. <laughs> and I was driving down Shepherd Drive without a helmet. I was only going a mile on my scooter. I was going 30 miles an hour. I thought, you know, what could happen in a mile? You can die. <laughs> Someone pulled out in front of me. I slammed on those brakes and come to find out motorcycles don't have anti-lock brakes. At least this one didn't. And they locked up on me. And I started heading face first into Shepherd Drive without a helmet. And I remember thinking two things on the way down. Number one, this is going to hurt. <laughs> Number two, stay awake. I told myself, Mark, stay awake. Watch me do this. 63. <laughs> I said, stay awake. This is no time for a nap. Because cars were coming. I was on Shepherd Drive, a five-lane road. And I hit head first and I had this loud ringing noise in my head and I couldn't hear anything for a minute and I'm sitting there and I'm awake. I'm so thrilled that I'm awake. I start directing traffic around me <laughs> and, and, and this redneck pulled up and I love rednecks. They're my people. I come from a family of rednecks. He pulled up in his truck. He looked down at me and he said, do you need an ambulance? <laughs> I said, I don't know. I can't hear a word you're saying. He said, woo, woo. I said, yes, because I glanced down at my knee and it was over here. And I remember thinking, that ain't right. But it wasn't hurting. I thought, oh, it's probably out of socket. They'll pop it back in and I go home. Uh-uh. When I tried to stand up, I realized I couldn't. And I thought, how am I going to get off this road? 
And I looked to the side of the road and there were some fellows standing there waiting on jobs. And I said, could y'all give me a help off the road? And they came to me with those brown arms and lifted me up off the road and were my good Samaritan that day. They carried me off the road and stayed with me till the ambulance showed up. Oh, then the ambulance showed up. They put me in there and we start heading towards the hospital. First thing I notice, ambulances don't have shocks. My legs start, and I've grown man boobs during the COVID. That's another thing I noticed. Anyway, so I'm going down Shepherd Drive in this ambulance, hitting every pothole, every speed bump. He could roll over a quarter and tell if it was heads or tails. And I said, what is wrong? They said it wasn't in the budget to have shocks. By the time we got to the hospital, my leg was wide awake. Oh my gosh, the nerves were sending messages. It was the most pain I had ever known in my life because I'd never had a baby. (laughs) And when they tried to move me, I'm telling you, when they tried to move me from the ambulance bed to the hospital bed was the moment in time I became so thankful that I am a Baptist (laughs) because Pentecostals would go to hell for what I said. I didn't even know I knew those words. Thank God for once saved, always saved. The doctor heard me and said, leave him alone. And I looked at that doctor and said, I love you. And he took x-rays and then he came into my room. Oh, first he brought me a morphine drip. Yes, he did. I became a Pentecostal. I went from hellish pain to heavenly gain. Now listen, as this group over here ages, I want to tell y'all, you don't have to suffer as you age. Order a drip. It will change your life. I I mean, the pain left. He x-rayed the leg, came in going, oh, Mark, you have shattered your leg. I said, oh, really? He said, yes, from the bottom of your knee to the middle of your shin, there's no bone left. It's all dust. I said, what are we going to do? He said, I'm doing surgery in the morning, and we're going to fill it up with cadaver bone. What's a cadaver bone? Dead people. From here to here are people I don't even know. But I love them. I just hope they were saved. Well, well, think about it. If they weren't saved and the Lord comes back, is my leg going to fall out? Or even worse, what if they were saved and the dead in Christ rise first? And I go chasing them through eternity. Get back in here. Well, that was my, that was another interruption. If y'all know of any other interruptions in the Bible, contact at info, wait, wait, contact at MarkLowry.com. I'm serious. Any other interruptions in the life of Jesus or Mary? I really would appreciate it. I love learning about that. All right, God bless. Bye.